So having said that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, John, John Dunford, and John is going to talk for 10 minutes. Um, so John, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Simon. Uh, I'm extremely worried that the only change to the 2021 exams is going to be a delay of a few weeks. It seems to me that that's the easy option, with the illusion of the government taking remedial action. But in fact, it will mean another pandemic-affected year with the same grading problems as we had in 2020. Exams in 2021 cannot be business as usual. High quality, moderated internal assessment must be part of the 2021 system of deciding grades. Years 11 and 13 have already lost learning time, but a very variable amount. And more learning time for some students is already being disrupted through periods of enforced isolation this year. A grading system must be devised that will be as fair as possible between students. Those in schools with big IT resources have barely missed a beat in their learning, while other students have had to spend long periods at home with little or no access to online learning. If delayed traditional exams do take place, largely unaltered, they will disproportionately help the advantaged even more than usual. The gap will widen further. Fairness means not only fairness between students of different backgrounds and ethnicities, but fairness among different exam centres and fairness between different years. And it seems to me that a group of education professionals is needed to recommend the most appropriate form of assessment for 2021. Exams for next year need to be designed to give all students a fair chance. Exam papers must recognise that not all students will have covered all the syllabus. That probably means that more of a choice of questions, and that's a minimum. External exams must be backed by evidence from the students' work during the year, with that work assessed by experienced teachers at the agreed national standard and externally moderated. In that way, exam grades could be a combination of external and internal assessment, and the balance between the two could, could vary between the subjects. To address the question of this evening's discussion, the best way to build trust in teachers' assessment is to put in place a system that moderates teachers' internal assessments to external standards. And the best way to do that is to train key staff in all exam centres. These lead assessors, as they might be called, would ideally be in every centre with more than one in large centres. This would do much to build public political and professional confidence in centre-based assessment. And lead assessors can oversee grading both in their own institution and also moderate grading in other centres. Now, if that could be put in place, even in a limited way for 2021, it could show the way forward for a better grading system in future. The best teacher I ever worked with showed me how internal assessment in English enabled his students to demonstrate their knowledge and skills across a much wider range than in any time-limited exam on a specific day in the summer. Combining external exams with moderated internal assessment is a more valid way of judging the knowledge of a student than external exams alone. And to deliver this improved system for 2021 and beyond, much training and assessment is needed. And assessment leadership has to be seen as a key role among the senior positions in schools and colleges. The Chartered Institute already has a suite of training courses in place. Chartered educational assessors are well qualified to carry out lead assessor work, but also to train other lead assessors to scale up the skill base. The aim of the Chartered Institute, which I used to chair, has always been to improve standards of education assessment. And I have to say, it's been the biggest professional tragedy of my 50 years in teaching and leadership that the government has chosen not to build on this, but instead to rely solely on external exams to determine students' grades. And that reliance on a single form of assessment left the system badly exposed in 2020, with no comparably reliable moderated internal grading information to fall back on. For too long, 
education ministers have not trusted teachers to judge the standard of the work of their students and the profession has largely stood by and let it happen. Imagine the outcry if the health minister decided that he knew better than doctors and that diagnosis was in future to be carried out by a separate government-run organisation. The lack of trust in teachers has deprofessionalised them and has undoubtedly contributed to the feelings of powerlessness that have driven so many out of the profession. Putting trust in teachers' assessments is about more than sorting out the 2021 exam grades. It'll make a major contribution to reprofessionalizing the teaching profession, who have shown this year such effort and dedication in the COVID crisis and will undoubtedly rise to the assessment challenges that are to come. Never let a good crisis go to waste, said Winston Churchill. So let's work to ensure that the COVID crisis leads to a better assessment and grading system in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that. And um, within time, which is always great. So thank you for that thought provoking contribution. I'm going to go straight over to Nick. Um, thank you. Well, I was going to start with never let a good crisis go to waste. But uh, John, you, you just beat me to that by about 30 seconds. But uh, you know, I, I suppose that underlines that I do I agree very strongly with with much of what, uh, or in fact, all of what John has said there. Um, we've absolutely become far too reliant on external examinations. Um, external exams alone have never been able to produce uh, wholly reliable or valid valid grades reflect performance in the round. And yet, we've allowed the system to emerge over the years, where where a set of tests alone um, are your gateway to work and life opportunities, and. You know, a process that is so fundamentally flawed in that way you live affects the grades that you get and the life chances that are open to you. So absolutely, don't let a crisis go to waste here. Now, we, we at NEHT have campaigned for a, a more balanced approach to assessment now for a number of years and, and a longer term system change. Um, with grading, that includes both internal and external elements to it. Uh, but I suppose the key point that I want to make today in, my, in these opening remarks is that in striving for a more balanced approach to assessment in the midst of this current crisis that we're facing. We really need to, by all means, seize the opportunities that are available to us, but we need to remain realistic and balance our, our high ambition with, with the grounded pragmatism about what is possible likely in the circumstances we face. Now, John's 10-point plan is, is incredibly strong, but time is absolutely against us. Um, I absolutely agree that we need to uh, we need to learn from the mistakes of 2020, um, but that cannot delay us in in giving the clarity to teachers and students right now about what is going to be happening this year. Um, now, the very unambitious proposals from Ofqual relate to GCSEs, AS, and A levels um, for 21, uh, 2021 are going to do very little, if anything, to mitigate the impact of the pandemic and uh, the resulting lockdown for many of uh, the students that will be experiencing that is uh, far too simplistic and based uh, on, on all examinations going ahead as normal in 2021. And that completely ignores the very real possibility of ongoing disruptions to teaching and learning. I mean, we're only in the second week of term and we're already seeing schools that are having to close because uh, pupils and teachers are testing positive for COVID. Um, every indication is this is not going anywhere at the moment. This is, you know, the situation is just going to get worse. So I absolutely think it would be sensible to prepare for the very real possibility that schools and colleges may have to submit some data, information or evidence to support the awarding of qualifications for some or even all of their, their pupils. But again, this needs deciding now so that schools can, can consider the systems that they need to have in place of assessment marking uh, and recording and, and make the changes now, not in three months time when the government finally wake up to, uh, to the reality around them. And so I suppose in recognizing that need, you know, I'll finish actually by just giving 100% support to John's call there and CIA is for the training of key staff in, in internal assessments. There's been absolute chronic underinvestment and attention paid to the fundamentals of, of assessment you know, from teacher training onwards for for as frankly as long as i can remember now it you know if we can secure any good from this current crisis let it be a renewed focus and priority on that uh thank you 
Okay, thanks very much, Nick. That's great. Um, Jeff. Hello there. Good evening, everybody. Jeff Barton, General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders. Very pleased to be here with you this evening. This is a moment, isn't it? And potentially it's a moment for us to be able to shine a spotlight on what lots of parents didn't realise, lots of the media didn't realise about the industrial way in which our examination system has run. But equally, it is a moment when some people are going to be saying, all I crave is normality. Can we get back to the way things were? And that's why I think we need to be really careful about what we are wishing for with all of this and to build a coalition, which isn't just, frankly, if you don't mind me saying so, the echo chamber that is giving up time at seven o'clock on a Tuesday evening to talk about this stuff, but other people out there who in some cases have seen their children apparently damaged by the process. So let's just talk things through in terms of what we might do in terms of children and young people, teachers and leaders. And I think, first of all, if you look at shorter term and longer term, there is, as both John and Nick have said, a short term imperative to do things for the coming year's exams. This idea that we're going to be able to run business as usual next year is utterly foolhardy, isn't it? Wouldn't it be the case? And isn't there an opportunity to say that some of that assessment could be got under young people's belt? Rather than the laughable suggestion that a mock exam, which we were hearing, weren't we, three or four weeks ago, was somehow going to count, isn't there an opportunity for our history department, our geography department, to be able to get some of that young people's assessment under their belt? And even if that doesn't necessarily count now in a modular way, it could count if, when they get to the end of the course, they can't sit the exam. And what that would do in the process is to rebuild the sense of why teacher assessment is important, because I think we shouldn't assume that everybody's thinking teacher assessment is a really good thing. I think there are a lot of parents and other people, certainly in the media, who will be raising questions about that. So when it comes to pupils, we owe it to them, as John says, to do more than just think by pushing exams back three weeks, that is going to be good enough. And I would talk not about modular assessment, because you wouldn't get that past Nick, Nick Gibb. I would have talked about phased or staged assessment as a safety net and showing that we have learned from the previous process. But of course, in the the bigger picture is, predictably, I'm going to say this, we do have to get to an education system, particularly with all of those new constituencies the government has got, which doesn't write off as collateral damage every year. 35% of children after their early years, their primary, their secondary teachers, telling them they've got a grade three, which when I said to Nick Gibb, what do you call a grade three, Nick, if you call a grade four a standard pass, what do you call a grade three? To which he said it's a good fail, presumably. Well, we have to do better at that. And it seems to me that the first bit of that, thinking about the shorter term, helps us to make a more coherent, persuasive argument about the longer term. Secondly, in terms of teacher assessment, well, this is a government smitten by independent and international research. Let's show that the places we would aspire to be absolutely trust in teachers and that there are ways of doing this. And I think that this is the moment when parents are going to understand that the obsession with so many exams at the end of a course in a digital age seems utterly ridiculous. And as someone who started teaching when we used to spend our time putting together red folders called uh, records of achievement, right, where you were putting loads of pieces of paper and things, there is a new way of doing that now, isn't there? Digital portfolios which are showing the wider range of skills and qualities and attributes that young people have got, plus an examined system. That seems to me a time that is ripe. Going back to Tomlinson and looking at some of those ideas around the diploma, this might be just the time to articulate that a bit better. And my final point, predictably, is we do have to make the case that using examinations in the way we use them now to judge the child, judge the teacher, judge the head teacher, judge the school with potentially huge consequences, we do have to come to the end of that. And it would be useful if a simple, easy decision was made tomorrow, which said that the performance tables next year are simply going to be abandoned. They're not going to tell anybody anything rigorous and we could do better than that. That would take the pressure off leaders, but longer term, it allows us to say, trust us to go and work in the communities that most need us and to bring the teachers into those communities who also are most needed in those communities. So those would be my opening thoughts. Okay, thanks very much for that, Jeff. Um, I'm gonna go straight on to Alison. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great opportunity, isn't it? This evening, here we are with um, colleagues who, who have a tremendous number of teachers as members behind us. And we're all thinking about 
what we might do to try and help. Because we cannot, we absolutely cannot have a repeat of what happened in the summer. People began to realise the inequity. They began to realise the unfairness. But as one of our fellows, Brian Lightman, has written about in his blog, you know, this is something that's been going on for some time. We've, we've been complicit, if you like, as a profession in knowing that a very large percentage of young people every year are told, as Jeff says, that they are failures. In fact, we have this at Key Stage 2, that we have our, our youngsters being told, sorry, you weren't good enough at the age of 11, just because they're about to embark on their secondary career. So clearly there's a, there's a big agenda which we need to focus on. But for the immediate, right now agenda, we need to think about what we're going to do. And I think it has to be a combination of methods. We asked our members at the Chartered College, Nick Gibb was talking about delaying exams and we asked our members, what do you think about this? So if I can just share with you, this is, this is representative of how difficult this is because two thirds of people who responded to our survey said, yeah, absolutely, we need to push the um, examinations back. We need to think differently. Another third almost said, no, no way, don't do that because if you do that, then you're starting to disrupt everything that follows on. Colleagues then in the free text were talking about what might we do? And they were the kinds of things that are being spoken about already this evening. So it would be things like providing greater choice within an examination so that if you've missed part of the syllabus, you're able to choose the areas that you've actually been able to study. Being able to provide more opportunities for uh, moderated assessments in year. I see today that one of the examination boards has been a bit opportunistic and is selling mock um, exams that, they, that you can pay for and they will mark. Um, I'm not sure that that's the solution that we need to look for as a profession. Um, colleagues responded about the fact that the timing in the year is, is all important. So being able to get the examinations marked and so on, the people that do this, um, the time would run out. So there are all kinds of issues and unintended consequences of actually moving the exam date. But what is really clear is that we have to do something. We have to, as, as others have said, we can't assume that everything will be the same this year because obviously it won't be. So I think it's a combination of, of those um, methods I've just talked about, but it's also, I absolutely agree, it's about building teacher expertise. I was previously a trustee of the CIEA, very proud to be a trustee of the CIEA. And when I moved to the Chartered College, I needed to resign that role. I couldn't be in, in, in both organisations at once. But both the Chartered College and the CIEA are absolutely committed to building teacher knowledge and expertise. And both organisations are committed to building a particular area of expertise, which is assessment. Because assessment is the most challenging, it's the most difficult area of our profession that we engage with. Because it's, it's, it's so <laughs> problematic. So we need to build that expertise in each centre, I completely agree with that. And in the meantime, it's how we work towards a solution that is owned by the profession. When you think about it, you know, this evening, the, the, the colleagues that are here on this panel, the colleagues that are attending this evening's event, we all care passionately on behalf of our members, our teachers, but ultimately on behalf of our children and young people, that we offer a fair system going forward. And frankly, we are the best people to make the best decisions going forward so that we can create a fair solution. So none of this is easy but we do deserve an opportunity to be involved in the conversation. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion as it carries on. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alison, for that. Um, and finally, in terms of the contributions, Mick, um, as the Vice Chair of the CIEA. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Simon, and thank you, uh, colleagues. Those were really uh, really interesting and, and, and intriguing uh, inputs. I, I think there's a number of things we can take already from what's not been said. Uh, this notion that you know, we are a profession, we're part of a profession, but we've lost the momentum. I think we've lost that momentum since the late 80s with the Education Reform Act. I think we've been to a period where things have been put on a plate for teachers, teachers have become de-skilled. And I think we've been our own worst enemies, to be blunt, as, as a profession. I think we've um, missed opportunities to, to take the lead. 
we're talking about trust tonight, and that trust has to be has to be earned. Um, we, we're going to have to earn this back because the trust has, has has disappeared, as indeed it has across the assessment system through what we've been through this over the last month or two. But that trust has got to be brought back by demonstrating, I think, demonstrating competence, I think one of the earlier speakers said. We can't just go and say, leave it to us, we can do it. That, that won't work. We've got to demonstrate that we have the professional capacity, the will, the knowledge and the understanding, as, as Alison was, was saying. We really need to build up the uh, professional capital that we've got, and that means we've got to develop the knowledge and understanding. I think Nick mentioned earlier about um, initial teacher training. I've, I've been doing research at the University of Leeds on this. Bias, which is one of the big issues that we've been talking about over the summer about be conscious or unconscious bias. 82% of people who completed the survey and the research I've been doing said that in their ITT, bias wasn't covered. And it goes on right the way through the various concepts, the key aspects, if you like, of assessment. These are not covered. Now, this is not having to pop at the ITT um, system. Um, they're under immense pressure. It's only 12 months in most cases to get people through training. We've got training now in, in skits, in all sorts of uh, guises. And for me, we're not doing sufficient to give our new teachers the, the knowledge and understanding that they need when they need it. They can't do it all in one go. They can't do it within the first 12 months. It needs to be ongoing. Now, we know at the Chartered Institute, we've got various courses, be you know, the certificate through to the Chartered Assessor. These are means of, 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 of putting that expertise back into the system. But we've got to work together. I think Jeff said th this is a moment, um, a, a time for a, a coalition. And I, again, I'm delighted to see the various people speaking tonight. This is a chance to actually work together. And I think we've got to demonstrate that we do have a plan. John started us off with his 10 point plan, which is blogged about uh, and it's been widely read. We need something to hang our coats on collectively and we need to work as a collection. Kenneth Baker said in 1988, one of the, easy, uh, one of the things that made it easy for him to get the Education Reform Act through was that the, the teaching profession was split into various factions, into teacher associations, unions, whatever you want to call it. And we are still split to some degree. We need to come back together and we need to come back together with a firm vision. We need to earn that place. And I think as Alison said, right at the heart of everything that we do are, are, are the kids. They're, they're what sit behind us. Every time I see a, a lot of teachers sat in a, in a hall at a conference, what's, what's in my mind is all those thousands of kids who, who sit behind them. And the kids this year have had a bad have had a bad deal. We've all had a bad deal, but we've got to come through that. So we've got to learn fast, as speakers have been saying. We need to do something now, something urgent, because we can't wait until next February or March for some kind of late uh, plan to come to be put forward. We need to act now. But we also need to think longer term. I think Nick mentioned about you know, time, time pressures. <clears throat> we need to start somewhere. We've got to start changing the system for the longer term too. And this is not just about exams. It's not just about internal versus external. I, for one, uh, am a believer in all forms of assessment, providing that they're good quality uh, and they're valid, reliable, etc. I'm not in one camp or the other. I want good assessment. But it's not just assessment about examinations and key stage tests. It's about teaching and learning. As Alison was saying, it's absolutely central to the process of teaching. It's the fulcrum around what teaching and learning works. So we need to develop that, we need to develop that further. So yes, we need a short term plan. We can't go through the, the upheaval that we've just had uh, over the summer. Uh, and, and Nick and Jeff and others have been superb in, in presenting, representing the, the, the profession in terms of reacting to some kind of you know quick reactions uh, from government policy. And they, in fairness, them are under pressure as well. But that pressure, you know, is not an excuse. We need to just do something about this. So I'm, I'm warmed by what people are saying. I think there's an opportunity to do something, but we've got to do this together. There's no point in little factions doing little bits here and there. We need a plan, whether we galvanise behind a, a 10 point plan, an eight point plan or whatever it is. We need something that we can work jointly that can build professional knowledge and understanding, but we must demonstrate that we can do it. It's not good enough just to say trust us, because the world won't trust us unless we can demonstrate that we've got the capacity. Teachers are bright people. 
and anything that I'm saying that sounds like a criticism of their lack of knowledge understanding, it's not because they're not capable. It's because they haven't had the support, they haven't had the structures. And it's been given away in a lot of what I've heard over the summer when people talk about we've got a moderation system in, in our school that we've been doing the best. No one's talked about standards. You cannot moderate unless you first set a standard. So we need to understand what the standards are. And it kind of gives the game away a little bit that we don't have the language, the assessment literacy that we, that we ought to have. But we can regain it. We can take the foreground, providing we work together, providing we work to a plan, and let's get the profession back onto the front foot. Okay, Mick, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, you will have seen a note from um, Ali asking people to um, pose questions via the chat, and they're, they're coming through, and I'll try to pick up some of those whilst um, directing a couple of questions um, initially to, um, I think I'm going to go to Nick first and then Jeff um, around the whole question about um, what do they, do you see as the, as the best platform to try and bring people together to actually lobby for investment in teacher assessment? Because I think that's a recurring theme across all the uh, inputs tonight. We need to have that investment we need a platform to argue the case successfully for that investment. So what platforms are there? Is there one? Do we need to create one? What's the vehicle to do that? So can I go to Nick first and then Jeff? Yeah, well, I think the point was, uh, Nick made the point very strongly, actually. Whatever the, this is, uh, we, we need to show that the profession is, is united in, in belief of the importance of this. Um, I'm, I personally um, think, you know, uh, the, the working with, with the College of Teaching has been really important over the last few years. I think the College of Teaching has been a fantastic, uh, you know, in very, come so far in such a short period of time. There's been a voice, uh, you know, an independent voice for the profession to, to talking on the basis of evidence of what should happen. So, um, Alison, I, I always love working with you. And, uh, you know, I think you, I think the College of Teaching has a really significant, important role within this. But the associations and teaching unions together also, of course, you know, we have, we represent, uh, an EHT represents 33,000 leaders. Uh, and, and with us all together, we, 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 you know, once again, when we are united in our voice, our voice is listened to by government. Now, you've got to look at the opportunities in all of this. You know, the, the fact is that uh, the politi politicians were badly burnt by the fiasco over the summer. They do not want a repeat of that. Um, they may not be making any sort of like good decisions in the moment in terms of what the future holds for, for exams for next year, but they're absolutely panicked by, by the fact that, that there might be another mess. So right now we're in a very good position for arguing what might be a pragmatic and what might be a very sensible thing to do, whether it's in the language of safety nets or whether it's even more, uh, more uh, bolder than that. So I think we've got to use every opportunity at our disposal. Um, but I do think that the, uh, you know, in the short term, there is, there is this, this window, this opportunity that we should capitalize on, that the that, that government are worried. They're worried because their backbenchers had their constituency inboxes filled with irate parents who were demanding to know what had gone wrong and they don't want to see that again. So once you start spooking the backbenchers, once you start getting negative headlines on the Daily Mail, and the, uh, the Telegraph, all of these are factors which actually mean that when you go with constructive alternatives to government, not attempting to bang the table and point the finger and say how wrong you were, but coming up with practical proposals for what could be better in the future, this is where I think we have a genuine opportunity to influence. And that is the trade unions, and that is the College of Teaching working together uh, and, uh, uh, and providing a united voice. Okay, thanks, Nick. Jeff, do you want to pick up on that thing about what's the platform to build this, the, the support for this? Yeah, I don't really get the word platform. It might be because, you know, until six months ago, platforms were things we stood on at, at stations, weren't they? And now they're just things where we see our own faces and see, in my case, my hair loss uh, being tracked. So, I, in a way, I prefer the term coalition. I think what Nick says there is absolutely right that subtext is you don't look to government for solutions on most things and I just do wonder whether there isn't an opportunity and I think Alison is critical to this by actually saying what does it mean to be a teacher in the 21st century suddenly parents have been looking to teachers and there have been some criticisms fanned by some bits of the media but a lot of parents have thought blimey I wouldn't want to do their job or I'm in admiration for their job and we've seen numbers of people wanting to do it 
even greater. And is this the moment when we start to talk about assessment in a more nuanced way and explain the fact that actually one of the uh, distinctive and seriously important parts of what a teacher is doing all the time is assessing your child. And what you get at the end of the process is, of course, a form of assessment, but it's not the only form of assessment. And what then follows on from that is whether it's in teacher training, whether it's uh, professional development, whether it's the career framework, whether it's the teacher standards, whether it's the head teacher standards, whatever it is, where is this showing up in all of that so that we're building that sense of a, a profession, taking ownership of it and persuading people who aren't in government, but governors, parents, that this is a fundamental skill that the teaching profession has got. And I think that being articulated in that kind of way a lot, uh, around a whole range of different uh, arenas would be one way of recalibrating what it is to be a teacher. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to go to Alison for a comment on that before I move on to something else. Do you want to pick up on those comments, Alison, around the, the yes. role and, you know, is that something that you can see um, you having some um, leverage on in terms of the role of the teacher? As yes, I, I very much hope so. Them. I very much hope so. Um, in partnership with, with other colleagues on this call, I feel, you know, there's a lot that we can do together. Um, it's interesting when we think about notions of professionalism and, and we, you know, we hear that analogy between the, the teaching profession and medics and so on. In actual fact, we have witnessed, haven't we, over this last number of weeks, government scientists being sidelined. Medics who come up with inconvenient solutions or inconvenient um, suggestions being quietened. So when we say, you know, the profession has been sidelined, it's allowed itself not to have a voice. This is a very, very significant challenge. And the only way it strikes me that we move forward and we gain the respect that we deserve is by behaving in a measured professional way, in harness, in harmony with colleagues together, coming, coming forward with ideas whereby we, we meet with people like Ofqual. Amanda Spillman is very powerful, isn't she now, when you think about it, leading both Ofsted and also going back to support Ofqual. We've got some very powerful uh, voices in the system and it strikes me that um, a coalition, as we've described today, is probably needed uh, in order to work together with those powerful voices to persuade them that actually there's more than one way of finding a solution. So I'm absolutely up for this, but not on my own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go over to John to pick up on those comments plus what he heard the other speakers say before I um, start fielding some of the questions that have come through the chat. So John, do you want to respond to that in relation to the coalition and how we go forward? Because as I said to you at the beginning, that for me is, is the key thing. How do, we, how do we take this forward given the opportunity that might exist uh, at the, in the current circumstances? You're on mute, John, sorry. This, this exactly addresses the second point of my 10 point plan. This is the, this coalition is the kind of professional group uh, that seems to me to be exactly the right. And we've got exactly the right group. And we've got the basis of that group here on this call now with ASCL and the HT and the Chartered College. Uh, and they could draw in other people in the way that the NHT did on its Commission on Assessment uh, several years ago, uh, and actually come up with some constructive ideas. Because as um, uh, Nick and Jeff were saying, if we put forward um, really good uh, constructive ideas about the way forward, then government ministers, and there may well be <laughs> different ones in place by then <laughs> um, on the law of averages, um, uh, may well absolutely want to grab it in both hands and say, yeah, this is something the profession's willing to sign up to. It'll create greater skill and assessment uh, and it'll give us something concrete to fall back on uh, when rather than if uh, things go wrong during the course of the year with, with, with COVID and, and lots more absences. Um. I'm going to start asking a couple of questions that have come up on the chat, which I'm hoping all the contributors can see. Um, this, this one is related to the, the whole issue of trust, which I'm going to 
sort of point at Mick around um, it's not just the wider public uh, confidence that's been knocked in teacher assessment, but you know, obviously, crucially, parents. And there is, um, and and how do we actually? start convincing people that um, we have got a robust system in place. Yeah, that, that, it's quite interesting actually, the um, NEHT commission that's been mentioned a, a, a couple of times now, that one of the key findings in there was about, uh, in fact, I think the, the phrase was, there's a worrying lack of trust within the profession itself. Um, and I think that, that is a, it is, it is a, a concern. And it's, I know it's in one of the uh, comments or, or questions. Um, and and that, you know, that, that's a worry. And some of this is around the accountability system, where people tend to worry that, you know, that I think every school I've ever been in, every teacher I've spoken to, they're absolutely convinced that they're doing everything right. Um, but they do worry about the school down the road because they tend to think they might not be. And we've somehow got to, we've got to knock that on, on the head. Uh, Parents tend to trust the school where their children uh, go to. I think schools generally have uh, really good um, uh, communications with, with, with parents. And I think there's a, a level of trust there. So the, 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 the big challenge is about developing that trust across centres, across schools, settings, whatever it might be. Uh, and again, that does come back to this uh, having, a, having a, a system in place. And I, I, again, I, I kind of like this idea of coalition that, that folk have been uh, mentioning. Um, as, as Alison said, a coalition of one doesn't really work all that, that well. So we need at least more than, uh, more, more than one on this, uh, on this group. But I think, you know, if we're looking at John's 10 point plan, which, you know, quite rightly, as I mentioned, point two was very much about that. Um, we've had commissions in, in the past, we've had people, uh, Nick's uh, NHT looking at accountability, the NHT commission that I mentioned, uh, ASCLO over the years have been great supporters of, of, of chartered assessors, but they've all been kind of spread out. So I think, you know, getting behind that suggestion of John's you know, action point number two, uh, to pull together a group who can actually come up with, uh, with a plan. I mean, John is a man with a plan. We don't seem to have too many of those about at the moment and Nick's absolutely right there is there's a, an opening um, politicians are, are nervous they'll get more nervous as time goes on they also like ideas um, and if the idea can be put I think Nick put it nicely about you know this is not going after anybody this is not trying to prove a point uh, this is about trying to improve our education and assessment system uh, and it's a serious business. So I, I think if we can come together, maybe it is kind of a body, a coalition. I mean, John chaired the maladministration committee not too long back, which is a you know kind of a model, if you like, of how uh, how we could coalesce around this 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 theme. Uh, but we'd have to take a, a plan that needs to move quickly because, as people have said, we need something now for next year but we also need to be looking to the longer term because there are training issues there are development issues there are developing the profession but we want to get the profession you know back on that on that front foot okay um there's been a few references to john's 10 point plan and we did actually send that out i'm just wondering ali is it worth a putting it up on the screen for people to be reminded of what that plan is and given what has been said by the various contributors and, and has come through on the chat, John, is there anything that you want to draw people's attention to in particular as the way forward? Because number two is the professional group, which I think we've touched on, but you know, there's other things in there which touch on a couple of the, the points that people are raising through the chat. I just think it might be useful to, to just pull that up for a minute to see what, the other points that you're putting forward as part of an overall strategy to look at 2021 and beyond. So I'm hoping Ali can put the screen up and John, you might be able to talk to some of the other parts of that. Yes, I mean, in a sense, Simon, I, yes, you can see the 10 point plan there on, on the screen. Um, in a sense, what I was trying to do here was mindful of the, the need for speed. Um, because anything that's going to be put in place has got to be put in place within the next um, couple of months at the very, at the very longest. Um, what we've got to do is build on what we've got. And what we've got is a lot of assessment expertise uh, around the country. We've got some specific expertise within the Chartered Institute and the notion that we could actually build um, and scale up uh, a lead assessor role, 
I think is probably key to the success of this. If we're going to get a good single national standard uh, that teachers would work to in their internal assessment. And if we can pr present something, as uh, somebody has said recently, oven ready, horrible expression, uh, <laughs> for, the, um, uh, for the government, I think the point's been made very strongly tonight that they could, they could really take that on board. Um, but we'd, we'd have to have a, just, yeah, a broader group than we've got just here tonight. But tonight's group could be the start of it. Mm. That's fine. Um, a couple of things to pick up on from that and, and again from the questions. I mean, there's a reference to um, awarding organisations and the fact that they are going to obviously play a crucial role in this. Um, and that there is obviously a lot of good practice out there that we could lean on. Somebody's mentioned city and guilds and, and you know, I'm sure there are other awarding organisations we could mention. So are there you know is that part of that wider group to people think and again I'll, I'll i'll ask jeff and then allison to comment on that in terms of what other uh organizations we need to involve because critically the awarding organizations are going to play an important role in 2021 let alone what might happen thereafter but th th it's going to be crucial to get them on board with any system that is going to support the work that they do so i'll go to jeff first and then to allison yeah no i think the awarding organizations need to be stepping up they need to be part of presenting solutions to all of this you know as a head teacher even three and a half years ago spending one hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year on those awarding organizations there is stuff which they could be doing now for the short term it seems to me and i think when we talk about coalitions without wanting to rain on anyone's parade it's it's one of those feel-good terms isn't it we'll all leave thinking great we're going to create a coalition but what what's the coalition about what is it we want to see that's going to improve and i think we need to do some thinking around that and our credibility is that if we can provide some quick fix solutions for the young people who run the risk of being disadvantaged in 2021 so what do they need it makes it easier then to articulate something about the longer term future and i would come back to that point that no high achieving country would think it acceptable for 35% of children after 12 years to be written off as failure. So what's the alternative? Could there be an English passport qualification, age 14, for example, which shows that you can do the basics in English and maths, which is akin to a driving license. It's not about comparable outcomes where only a certain number of young people can do it. If you are able to demonstrate you've matched the skills and knowledge, then you can hold up with dignity a sense of achieving it. So we could do the bigger stuff if we can get a sense of what are the quick fixes. But as John reminds us, time is really running out. And having been talking to the Department for Education, I suspect they are pushing to try and make decisions within the next 10 days or so. And if we're going to influence those decisions so they are sensible decisions in the interests of young people and teachers and parents, then we need to act really quickly in knowing what they are. Thanks. Um, I said I'd go to Alison next. So I, I would suggest that um, the, the group of us on this call um, request a meeting and say, you know, we would like to help. Um, we would like to be part of this. Um, and that we then make sure that a timetable is agreed as soon as possible because schools need that certainty. That we then work with the organisations, whether it's the awarding bodies, um, with Ofqual, wherever it needs to be, to make sure that we have some um, interim assessments that schools are able to use. I think we need some practical, immediate work because if we talk about setting up a commission and get ourselves comfy and then arrange some meetings, by the, by the time it'll be Christmas before we've done anything. So it feels to me as if, um, not in a hysterical way, but in a way that just demands um, that we need to be listened to, that we should ask to and meet with those people who are presumably having these conversations right now. Um, you know, we, I asked yesterday what was happening about the timetable for examinations and the response from the minister was, um, we know this is urgent, but we're not quite there yet. Well, good, because we can help, hopefully. Maybe I'm being hopelessly naive. I am kind of optimistic, but um, I, I feel like now's the moment. Otherwise, we're just talking, aren't we? And so I'm just going to thank 
again all the contributors for their time this evening it's been a very uh, helpful discussion very interesting um, so thank you to all those contributors um, John Jeff Allison Nick and Mick and to all of those um, who've joined the webinar this evening I hope you found it helpful we will have the recording of it on the website soon thank you very much and we will as they say be in touch very soon thank you all thank you